In the 90s, Playmates Toys made the deepest line of Star Trek action figures in history. My name's Keith, and I'm a collector working towards owning all 284. I've been a Trek fan for almost 35 years, and most people are sick of me talking about it. But somehow I've convinced my old friend Mike to review them with me on... Look at my Star Trek toys! Hello and welcome to Look at my Star Trek toys! We are talking about Deep Space Nine Series 1. This is part two. If you missed part one, go back and watch part one. Otherwise, you're going to miss half of the kick-ass Deep Space Nine Series 1 toys. I'm Keith. My co-host is Mike Indeglio. How's it going, Mike? I'm go it's going well, man. I would say things are going Deep Space fine. Uh, I quit. Uh, I've got a purple. Sorry, the show's over. Thank you for watching. Color going because uh, purple seems to be the color of the day in our line. We've got the purple undershirts, which I prefer to the other ones, and we're going with the black and red theme on many characters. I loved Quark; he was rad. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm loving what I'm seeing. So let's jump back in. Maybe we'll see some uh, more uh, uh, gender diversity. And in, in this line moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Good point. Well, let us, in fact, that might be perfect because our next toy is 6205 Lieutenant Jadzia. Dax, let's have her beam in. Yes, folks, it's Terry Farrell <clears throat> who played Jadzia Dax on the series. Uh, so Dax was. A very interesting character, which uh, you can see from the spots there that this is not a human character. Uh, there's a lot going on. L let's just have you guess. What's What type of alien might Dax be? Well, uh, she's from a planet uh, with, that is, uh, it's it's a comment on, on Master and Slave Keith. <laughs> There's a, it's a slave race where they uh, tattoo the slaves, and she escaped uh, in order to now uh, serve the Federation on the space station Deep Space Nine. Oh, interesting. All right, so that we sort of cover that a little bit in in Discovery uh, with with uh, Commander Saru. Uh, anyway, okay, interesting guess, but here's the answer. <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> I feel like my, the, my take it, was much darker than the truth. It was very dark, <laughs> but honestly, Deep Space Nine is pretty dark. Okay. So it, it would not be uncommon to uh, to have that sort of a story. Uh, but in this case, Dax is a trill, which oh, means yeah. she is both the host and there is a symbiotic alien inside her who is actually Dax, whereas Jadzia is the host. And Dax, the symbiote, lives outlives the hosts and has at this point i think gone through eight or nine different hosts as eight or nine completely different people of different races and genders and so jadzia dax comes onto the station both as somebody who was 300 years old who has lived eight or nine lives and as a young inexperienced science officer and who was best friends with our good friend Captain or Commander Cisco in her previous host as an old man? Am so I mistaken in saying I, re I recall the trill from a weird TNG episode where Riker is like hosting one, and there's like a weird romance? Yes, there is a very weird and uncomfortable episode of Next Gen, which in actually uh, first introduces the trills, uh, although. Clearly, they went through a redesign because the trill in Next Generation had sort of the, the traditional forehead ridges and without the spots. Uh, but for Deep Space Nine, you know, uh, science be damned, we're going to redesign how all the trills look. So the and spots and such will... only come after the human host is... Uh... No. no. No, she had the spots the whole time. That's just the sort of the genetic makeup of the host People, species. Oh, gotcha. Um, but they, they just did not want to put weird prosthetics on top of Terry Farrell. So, uh, but they actually hand painted those spots on every single. Oh yeah. Every single day. So uh, I think they had, 
I, I don't even think they had a, uh, a stencil. I think um, the uh, makeup department actually just did that every single shooting day. So yeah, a lot is, of work they're there. They're very cool. Let's see if I can't get us a little bit of a... Sorry for the behind the scenes here. I just want to get a... Oh, God. Oh, the, the lack of professionalism on this show is, is unbelievable. Uh, yeah, so pretty good detail on the figure itself um, that matches uh, what she actually was actually had for the uh, most of the series, which was pretty cool. Uh, obviously, Dax here is a Federation officer, or Jadzia was a Federation officer, and then Dax, when uh, joined, uh, also became that. So she was the primary science officer on the Deep Space Nine. Tell me your thoughts. I love it. I, I love a teal. I'm getting my, my teal fix here. Uh, I She's got a, a sensible ponytail, which I imagine isn't the easiest thing to model. Or, you know, it's not, you can't just plop other hair. I always find that, like, uh, a lot of female toys m takes that extra step because, or female models, because they got they have to get the hair right. Um, and Well, it's also delicate. You have a really thin point right there, which I imagine a lot of them broke off. Yeah, and, you, and you'll notice it does not come to any sort of a point, because someone's job is to make sure that doesn't stab any kids. <laughs> right. I'm um, interested as a science officer what her what her accoutrement were. Oh, well that's a uh, that's a good question. I don't have a box in front of me because I think I only have one copy of uh of Jedzia Dax, but let me let me go one of the resources I use for this show frequently is uh, wixaban.com mm -hmm. which has a huge archive of all of these uh all of these toys. Let me see if they have a. Um, I don't know. She's got some toys. She's got some science stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's all sciencey. She's got you know, science crap. You know, brain stuff. It's not stuff you'd want to play with. It's like a sensor and stuff. Mm. She's cool. She's a cool toy. Yeah, really cool. Really cool character too. And uh, uh, I, I will not give any spoilers as to her eventual fate, both romantically and practically. But. Very interesting character uh, throughout the series. And th I think that's part of the one of the reasons I like Deep Space Nine so much is because the characters themselves had more character development than any other series of the 90s era. They developed way more than Next Gen. They developed way more than Voyager. They all really went on journeys and changed a lot. And I thought that mm -hmm. was one of my favorite parts about the show. So, speaking of changing, let us move forward to 6206. We are going to meet Major Kira Norris. Now, Major Kira, you will note from her uniform, is also not in Starfleet. She was the first officer, essentially, of the station, and she is part of the Bajoran military. And uh, so she is a Bajoran, and uh, she's played by Nana Visitor, and uh, so fantastic, awesome character. Really, really liked her. Tough as nails. She fought in the uh, in the resistance against the Cardassians before she joined the show, and has this huge, like, dark and violent past, um, but is really, really fun. Um, now you'll see on this figure that she was uh, has short hair, but in the pilot, she had sort of longer hair like a bob. So if we hop over to Toy Cam, we can see Toy Cam. I'm trying. Toy Cam Good Lord, man. Toy, toy Cam. <laughs> when a man asks for Toy Cam, you provide. When a man asks for Toy Cam, you give him Toy Cam. <laughs> <laughs> So this uh, hair that she has in her oh. card, she only wore for the pilot before they cut it back for most of the rest of the series. But it did eventually, by season seven, grow back out to this length. But at that point, she had become a Starfleet officer. No spoilers, I guess. Spoilers. Uh, anyway, so uh, they're also 
If you want to get super nerdy, there are two versions of this figure. And we're going to talk about the next one later. But this figure was included in a set that they sold um, of sort of like the, the captains and leadership. And the Deep Space Nine characters were the only ones that did not get an alternate uniform. So the next gen, I think it was, it was uh, Picard and Riker, and they were in their dress uniforms. Um, but for these guys, they just duplicated... Uh, for Deep Space Nine, it duplicated the old figures. The only difference is that those ones are not numbered. So if you're keeping hmm. track at home and you really want to get all 283, you need a numbered Kira and an unnumbered Kira from that set. Uh, I've got them both, and I'll, I'll show you the unnumbered one later. It's going to look a lot like this just without a number printed. I dig it. I love the red. Definitely jumps off the page because of the red. Uh, I like the detailing they gave us me they gave they're giving me the earrings. I'm interested, Keith, whether the boot choice here of basically Uggs, but they're textured, you can see the top. <laughs> they're like they've right. got a very specific design. I'm wondering if that matches a character design from the show or if it's just texturing to to match the sort of uh, of that of the jacket. Well, we didn't see her feet very often, but when we did, I remember she had sort of a red like boot with a heel that was a that was definitely not Uggs. That was definitely not what we saw of her feet going forward. But you know, again, as we as I mentioned uh, on another episode, these were developed way ahead of time. So obviously, this one was developed after they had shot the pilot and decided to cut her hair, but very much early in the development. So they might have made different choices on some of the little details like this. Um, but unlike next gen, they had a, a sort of a less chaotic development process for deep space nine. There's an amazing uh, documentary about the development of next gen called chaos on the bridge. I think it's on Netflix. Definitely go check it out. It's fascinating. But uh, for deep space nine, they had a little bit more time, they had a little bit more money. So they had a better sense of what they wanted to do when they started that series. So I think it is time. All right, well, here, here we go. Here's another thing for Mike, to, to play with Mike. Coming up in the rest of our figures, there is going to be one of the actors that actually, during the run of the series, will marry Nana Visitor, they will have a child, and then split by the end of the series. So I'm curious who your guess would be on uh, who they went through that journey together. That we've already met in our figure journey? No, that we're about to meet. In the rest of the figures from today. How the how, how would I know? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, look, I try not to like look, memorize the toys before we show them. Well, you don't have to guess now. I'm saying by the end of the episode, oh, oh, okay, you have to okay, guess. Great, great. I don't want to have a fight in front of our friends. <laughs> that wasn't fair. <laughs> they hate it when we fight. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let us move forward. Let's meet our first Cardassian in 6207 Gull Ducat. Ooh, I love a baddie. Yes, the Cardassians. One of the primary bad guys yes, for Yes, now Deep we're Space talking. Nine. This is Gul Dukat, played by Mark Alimo, uh, who we saw before. He was one of the first uh, Romulans in on Next Generations. At the end of season one, I think it was the neutral zone, we saw him as a Romulan, and he was a frequent Star Trek actor in various roles. Mark Alimo, terrific actor. And this ended up being one of the most interesting characters on the entire series. Um, and he's used to be, he used to run the station during the occupation. And of course has all of this antagonistic history with Kira. Um, and then goes on a wild journey throughout the seven series. So this is the, uh, the Cardassians. You have not met the Cardassians before. Tell us what you know. Make some guesses. Uh, they're bad guys. They, uh -huh. uh, they, they're sort of like the Romulan. They look Romulan-y. Yeah, right. Romulish. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm imagining that your Vulcans hate these guys too. Right. Yeah, sure. Everybody, everybody hates them. I think they probably have some. Uh, I'd love to see. I would love to see the the RuPaul's Drag Race version starring some Car- Cardassian queens because I feel like the fashion sense here is very stark and could really use a little bit of. A little zhuzh? A little zhuzh. I'd love to see him sashaying away. That's about all I have. <laughs> really, that's about, as, <laughs> that's about as deep into the well I can dig. Well, I mean, and this, and of course the Cardassians, now, is uh, that, are unfortunately. Those, is that his skeletal structure that we're seeing, or is that uh, is that bone? Is it? On his neck, they do have neck ridges, which is part of the awesome makeup effects for this. Mm-hmm. So that, I mean, obviously the suit is the suit, but that is his actual neck or the, the, the Cardassian neck. The figure is giving me the impression that they had a different maybe eye design because it, they look like they're, maybe it's just the the, vid, the footage. They look cooler than the, the human eyes. I guess you can be more expressive with your human eyes, balls in. Yeah, no, they, they basically look like they do... Uh, in the in the the picture there, interestingly, uh, just trivia wise, because that's all we're talking about. Marco Limo played a different Cardassian on the Next Generation as well, and they had these ridiculous face hugger things over their face. So mm. this was this was the second draft of what the Cardassians looked like <laughs> when they uh, did Deep Space Nine. But really cool villains. They were sort of like space Nazis. <laughs> and uh so they were so you know they occupied Bajor and had horrible uh you know camps all over the place so it was it was dark again like the the tone of deep space 9 was just much darker right um than next gen and so uh Gul Dukat was a pretty dark character desperately in search of redemption throughout the entire series to various levels of success so uh yeah so Interesting, cool. Um, I like the figure. The face modeling doesn't look really like Mark Alimo. I would have bought this as a generic mm-hmm. Cardassian um, and then was surprised when I looked at the package and it was actually uh, attributed as Gul Dukat. So I wonder if that wasn't a change that yeah. they decided, oh, you know what? Let's make it Gul Dukat. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It, the, the likeness isn't really there, and the other thing that it highlights is, is is because the sort of the the facial and muscular and skeletal modeling at, at the top, at, in conjunction with the really cool costuming, the really detailed costuming on the boots and on the shirt, uh, t- texturing, excuse me, does highlight how sort of they were sort of out of ideas with the legs. Like if you're not He-Man <laughs> figure and you're not given the super muscles, you know, the super quads that some right, figures have, right. and, and you don't have like a cool pant texturing like we saw in some of the series one of the Next Generation pant, uh, characters, you sort of get right. this. You get sort of like generic stick figure, action figure leg. Look, he, he had a lovely pair of leggings on underneath his, <laughs> uh, his armor. Yeah. Uh, but... Uh, yeah. Anyway, so that's Gull Ducat. And now is he taller in size at all? I guess not. Uh, like slightly than some of the other, like if you put him up against. Well, let's put him up against Benjamin Zisco on Toy Cam! Um, slightly. So he is slightly taller. I don't, I actually don't know how tall Mark Alimo is. They're, they they were always presented on the show as roughly the same size as humans. Um, not where like Klingons are always portrayed to be a little bit bigger, and Ferengi are always uh, portrayed to be a little bit smaller. They were roughly the same size, at least as as I noticed on my watch. Uh, okay, hold on, I've got to get her on the right sheet. I keep pulling up next week's episode. It's going to be fun. It's going to be really fun. We're going to do uh, one hit weirdos, but uh, let us instead move forward. To figure 6208, Dr. Julian Bashir. So, this is Julian Bashir, the young and uh, egotistical doctor, played by Alexander Siddig, although he was billed as Siddig El Fadil to uh, begin the series. This is the guy, Keith. 
This is the guy. This is the guy. This, this is the, the guy interest. you think of? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, you're uh, totally right. Yes, I am. There was a, uh, a, a there's an amazing um, <laughs> little soft break of the fourth wall later in the series where um, in real life, uh, Nana Visitor was pregnant. And of course, they had to write a whole story as to explain why she was pregnant. <laughs> and a great sci-fi workaround. No spoilers, but amazing sci-fi workaround. Uh, but on the at the moment where she was giving birth, and of course he's the doctor, so he's doing that. She looks at him directly as she's like, they were like fighting or something, and she looks at him directly and says, "This is all your fault," <laughs> which it totally was in real life as well, which was pretty funny. Uh, anyway, so uh, Alexander Siddig was born in the Sudan, raised in London, and you might recognize him from Game of Thrones as one of the uh, as the father of the Sand Snakes. Mm, uh, I only watched the last season of Game of Thrones. Why would you only watch the bad season? What's wrong with you? Why would you even start? I, 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 I don't know if we can do a show together. What the hell's wrong with you? I just, I wasn't watching Game of Thrones, wasn't into it, and then my wife was, so I decided to just like jump in with her at the end because she was so excited. She was going to a bunch of oh, parties, and I was like, I want to go to the parties. Oh, for goodness sake. And you, of all people, the nerd, the collector, the completist, didn't go back and at least watch the beginning? It, so I'm not, that's not like, fan, that type of fantasy isn't sort of my jam usually. Outside like The Witcher I'd really dug, but that's not what this is about. That's, I'm not really into that kind of fantasy. I'm, right, sorry. Well, I'm going to yell at you off air. All right. Uh, Bring it back. Anyway, so back to, uh, do, back to Dr. Bashir. Uh, another, another character who goes on a really interesting journey in his, uh, his character's development throughout the sheer, throughout the, uh, throughout the show, um, which I find it is a little bit controversial what happened with it, but I loved it. Um, he ended up of course being best friends with Colin Meany's character, uh, Chief O'Brien, and so they would have lots of hijinks on the holodeck, and was, uh, once we get into series two, uh, we will see his mysterious other best friend, who we will talk about later, but now let us hop forward and talk about the last figure of Deep Space Nine series one, six, two, one, zero, Morn. Let us meet... Morn. Ah! No, I just noticed that on the graphic, the <laughs> he's drinking like a cordial. I screwed, no, I screwed up. The uh, I I supposed to do the character's name and the actor's name, oh. but I so I've car- I've credited uh, Terry Farrell as playing the character, <laughs> and the character's name is Mark Allen Shepard. This oops. is the professionalism you get here. Well. You know what? We can't undo it. So here it is. We sure as heck can't. So this is uh, this is Morn. So before I say anything about it, tell me what you think Morn is. Uh, Morn is an actor who showed up to the set the first day and was like, "Ah, god damn it." <laughs> <laughs> He's got to put all this crap on every time. Come on. Uh huh. Uh-huh. I'm loving, I guess we're not going to get on the action figure. I'm loving that, like, is that Peach Fuzz hair he's got going on up there? He does have a little <laughs> goofy bits of hair. Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing he's a comedic character is my guess. I'm guessing he's got, like, an Orko vibe from the from the He-Man. Uh, he's just got that sort of, that, uh, they definitely pulled this from their, like, find me a stock figure, like a, he's cool. I like that he's, it's different. That, that for sure, it's, it jumps off the shelf for me. Um, who was the He-Man guy who like you could like scrunch him down real mini? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, I did not actually watch much He-Man because I I was in a I was in a you have to watch PBS house. I was no, a I'll, very sheltered sad child. Find out, but anyway, yeah, it's a cool figure. I like it. Tell me about tell me about uh Gorn Morn Gorn Morn 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 Morn. And uh, you know, looking at him today, he definitely looks like a gray Thanos. Mm. Especially with like even with like the gauntlet hands and everything, uh, but he is not. Morn, played by Mark Allen Shepard, was a character who sat in Quark's bar at the same seat and was there 
every single time we were in Quark's bar. In fact, he he was a play on Norm from Cheers. So his name is actually oh, an anagram God. for Norm. And as a joke, to be the opposite of Norm, the character never speaks in the entire run of the show, even though he is constantly referred to as a chatterbox. He never speaks. He was in more than 90 episodes. So and I wonder, how they, I wonder how does he get, he get paid? Uh, well, this is, this is the real sort of bummer about it when you think about it, because in 90 episodes that he was in, including an episode that was named uh, for him and all about him, Mark Allen Shepard was never even credited on yeah, the show. Sucks. He was an extra. He was a background actor. Huh. So he got an action figure. He got a, a an episode all about him, but he's not even credited in the episode that he's in. That's, that's, that's weird. That's about the character, which is weird and seems seems uh, seems wrong. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was a really fun character. We. Didn't spend a lot of time with him, which is why it was interesting that they made a figure, especially in the first series, um, right. which makes it feel like like Morn was a, a, a bigger character on the show. But he was always a delightful little joke you saw every once in a while. Um, and the episode Who Mourns for Morn is really, really fun. Uh, it's uh, one of the later ones is in uh, season six, Who Mourns for Morn, a delightful episode. So uh, tell me, tell me more about what you feel about this. I definitely would have picked him up. Right now, I'm I'm thinking I would have picked him up for sure in the store. I think I would have probably skipped uh, Bashir. Dr. Bashir, yeah, yeah, and uh, definitely uh, Gull Ducat probably would have been picked up. I would have got the Ducat, ladies. Yep. I, yeah, I think they were cool. Uh, all in all, I'm. I think I prefer. You know, I liked TNG. I, I definitely think my my highlight is uh, is Quark from this series, mm. uh, which I think was here. Nope, just kidding. He was third down. <laughs> oh, I'm just beaming everybody in. <laughs> oh, he was in the last episode. Anyway, oh, here we go. <laughs> I had everything in order. I blew it. Everything is all gone to hell. We're gonna beam you into space. No. I... Uh, yeah, so you liked you liked Quark best out of DS9 series one. Yeah, I like a little I like a little pop of color, uh, and he 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 brought some character that I really appreciated. Uh, and before I forget, for speaking of completionist, since I dropped a reference earlier, and then uh, that character I was talking about that he reminded me of that Morn reminded me of was Ram Man. Ram Man. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, he had that stocky kind of build. And was sort of a, a funny character. Although Rayman, if I'm not mistaken, did speak. So regardless. Well, uh, really, you know, fun little sense of humor built into the show to have a Cheers reference. Um, I think they might have actually shot on the same lot or somewhere near, which is why they were sort of more likely to make a joke like that. And certainly very, a lot of members of Cheers ended up on the, on the series at some point. We, of course, saw... Uh, 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 lots of people in next gen. All right. Well, look, that is Deep Space Nine series one, the complete. If you, uh, as I mentioned before, part one, just click over there. We also did all of the next gen series one. And next week, we are going to do uh, the episode I teased one hit weirdos, where we are going to focus on some of the uh, weird aliens or people that showed up. For only one episode. And yet, Playmates was like, you get a figure. Like Big. Oprah, giving out figures. You get a figure, and you get a figure. And you can do us a favor and like and subscribe this video. If you have any other folks who enjoy action figures or Star Trek, let us know about the show. Uh, we hope to grow. We hope to have a, a conversation with everybody. And uh, we... We'll see you next week here on Look at My Star Trek Toys!